Assalamualaikum. I first want to congratulate my brothers and sisters of the Islamic Circle of North America for 50 years of sharing Islam and serving humanity. And it is my dua that the next 50 years be even more productive, be even more effective in sharing this message of Islam and serving the people of the United States. Say Ami. Ami. Alhamdulillah. Brothers and sisters, Back when I was a high school student in the late 1960s, it was beyond comprehension for me to even imagine that in 2018, that some of the same issues that we were standing in protest against in the late 1960s would be very similar issues that the nation would be engulfed in in trying to raise the specter to bring to the forefront of the conscious and the moral conscious of our leaders of this nation that in a country like America and even anywhere in the world that is unacceptable, totally unacceptable for any one group of people to be targeted for oppression for a system of structural racism to put into place a kind of way of life that would fossilize a people in the underbelly of the society as we've had with African American people, with Latino people, and other people of color in this country. And so many Muslims have raised the specter because many who have come to this country have not had the luxury of being able to protest without getting heads cracked and these kinds of things. So many Muslims, not just for this reason, have a question as to whether or not it is lawful within the confines of Islam to be able to stand out and protest against acts of zulm, of acts of oppression. I want to just give one quick example. This may not be convincing to those who think that we as Muslims should stand on the sidelines of history. But after the acceptance of Islam by Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu, we find that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for the first time in this young Islamic movement had two pillars of the community to individuals that because of their embracing Islam that now the Muslims would be able to pray around the Kaaba openly for the first time. And because of this, my reading of the Sirah, the history of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my reading of the Sirah tells me that this first demonstration led by Muslims was Umar ibn al-Khattab leading one line of believers and Hamza ibn Abu Talib, Mutalib leading another line and the Muslim brothers stood behind them and they marched to the Kaaba. Now they were strong enough to show that yes, we are open with our worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we're demonstrating to you that a new day has arrived. Now, of course, they were still quite a few years away from the establishment of the Islamic State, but this, if it were anything, this was a demonstration on the part of the believers. Brothers and sisters, in August of 2016, a, a, a professional quarterback in the National Football League by the name of Colin Kaepernick, 
Colin Kaepernick was the quarterback of the San Francisco 49ers at the time. He had taken this team to the Super Bowl. His skill set was unquestioned. But Colin Kaepernick had a conscience. And Colin Kaepernick decided that it's one thing for me to live the lifestyle that I live, that I'm making all of these millions of dollars every year, but how can I be comfortable in my existence? How is it that I can look myself in the mirror when I see what's going on out in the society, when I see so many of my brothers and sisters being shot down in the street by police officers like dogs with, no, with total impunity. So Colin Kaepernick first decided that during the playing of the national anthem, he said to himself, I'm not going to enlist other people, but because of my personal conscience, I'm going to just sit during the national anthem. And it was during the second game that he, when he was sitting that the news reporters looked over and they saw him sitting on the bench. And they made a very big deal. They made a big issue out of this. And when they asked Colin, why are you sitting? His response was, I'm sitting because my brothers are being shot down in the streets by those who are charged with protecting and serving the community. So as long as I need to, I will stand, I will continue to stand with those who are oppressed. This was a very courageous move on his part, I would imagine, but little could he uh, project that because of this particular stand that he would be eventually blackballed out of the National Football League that bums would actually be recruited, not bums in, a, in, a, in, in the, 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 the stereotypical sense. I'm not saying, I'm saying bums, quarterbacks with little ability to lead perhaps even high school teams were picked up by professional teams all across the NFL and Colin Kaepernick as the months and now years go by sees that he's unable to be able to even get a job, even though he had been a quarterback that led a team to the Super Bowl. Brothers and sisters, in 2014, some of you may have heard of an NBA player by the name of LeBron James. LeBron James in 2014, Kyrie Irvin, Jared Jack, Kevin Garnett wore t-shirts as they went into their arena saying, I can't breathe. And the reason why they were wearing these t-shirts saying, I can't breathe was because of New York City police officers choking to death Eric Gardner on the streets of New York while he was standing on these streets selling cigarettes. And so these athletes with a conscious step forward and say, we can't, we're not going to make elaborate statements, but we must do something. It's our responsibility to do something. So they wore these t-shirts saying, I can't breathe. In 2014, five members Five members of the St. Louis Rams professional football team came out on the field with their hands up in an iconic pose that was popularized by the protests in Ferguson, the killing of Mike Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Five professional football athletes. In 2014, members of multiple Women's National Basketball Association players came out and either were wearing shirts, hashtag Black Lives Matter, or wearing other shirts protesting what was happening to 
unarmed men and women on the streets and what was happening because of law enforcement. Brothers and sisters, I don't have the time, but we can just quickly reflect that this was not the first time that professional athletes in America decided to take a stand and be open in their positions against oppression in this land. You remember better than me that in 1967, the heavyweight champion of the boxing champion of the world, Muhammad Ali, decided that I'm not going to fight against another people of color in Vietnam. No Vietnam, Vietnamese, no Viet Cong has ever called me the N-word. That I'm being oppressed right here at home, so what sense does it make for me to go fight against another oppressed people of color? In the 1968 Olympics, and I'll finish here in a moment, in the 1968 Olympics, two African-American sprinters, one by the name of John Carlos, the other by the name of Tommy Smith. As they stood on the podium, the winner's podium, one, each one of them had a black glove and they were holding up their glove in a black power salute. They were immediately kicked out of the Olympic Village and sent home. The pressure that these men experienced over the years because of this righteous protest is almost unimaginable. Brothers and sisters, it's acceptable in this country for professional athletes to have a social conscience. And I want to quickly make a distinction between social conscience and social justice. When Colin Kaepernick has be, had been refused to be put on any professional football team, the National Football League negotiated with the Players Association to give the players $90 million to distribute these funds to various charities. That it's okay, it's even expected for professional paid athletes to be involved in their communities, to work with inner city kids, to help them with their education, to help in areas where people are lacking in housing and sufficient food that is expected. That's social conscious. That means that you're taking a stand out of your recognizing the necessity for those who are the have-nots of those who are, being, who are being deprived for whatever reason that you recognize that we need to do something for these people. But as Colin Kaepernick found out, as John Carlos and Tommy Smith, as Muhammad Ali found out, as so many others have found out that in America, with this structural racism that pervades every aspect of the society, that is not all right to have a stand for social justice. So when Colin Kaepernick came forward and said that this killing of these boys on the street, it's got to stop. We have to bring more attention to it and I am prepared to sacrifice my career. I'm prepared to sacrifice the kind, the style of living that I have been typically living because I stand for something. As our brother El Haj Malik Al Shabazz said over 40 years ago, that a man, and it could be applied to women as well, a man who doesn't stand for something will fall for anything. And so as a Muslim community living in this early quarter of the 21st century, we have to ask ourselves, what do we stand for? What do we stand for? Do we only stand 
for those things that reflect a social consciousness that we need to feed the hungry, we need to house the homeless? Or do we understand our responsibilities as Muslims to enjoin what is right, to forbid what is wrong, to take a stand in the society in which we live for that which is right? We can't pretend that we don't see what's going on in America today. Yamakiyama, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us, what did you do? You had social media. You could know when things were happening almost the instant that it happened anywhere in the world. When Stefan Clark was being murdered by police in Sacramento, California, you knew about it because just one click with the social media, it was spread all around the planet. We knew about it. The interesting thing about the killing of Stefan Clark, and I'm sure you know his story, he is a young African-American male in the backyard of his grandmother talking on the cell phone. And like so many others, a report was made that some black dude is going around robbing people or breaking in the cars. I can't remember which one it was. So the police go and they're combing the neighborhood and here is this man standing, talking on the cell phone. They shoot, jump out of their cars in 11 seconds. He's riddled with bullets. 11 seconds, 20 shots tear his torso apart. Those Muslims who were washing and preparing his body for janazah. Yes, he was a Muslim. Those Muslims who were preparing his body for janazah said that they couldn't do the traditional washing because he was just ripped and torn apart. They couldn't just wash him the way you would traditionally wash our dead. But the Muslim community had a very peculiar response. And that response was, well, it's just another one. This has been going on for years now. Until many of us found out that the man was a Muslim and then the concern, a real Muslim? Now he's black, are you sure he's a real Muslim? Like we are real Muslims. And once it was determined, yes, he's a real Muslim then the empathy and concern began to pour forth. And I stand here today reminding myself and reminding you that it's not just the fact that this man is a Muslim. He is a human being. And our concern for human beings who are shot down like dogs in the street, that there's more concern for our pets, our animals in this country than there is for human life and certain human life. So it seems very strange to me that so many of my Muslim brothers and sisters, when they hear the mantra of Black Lives Matter, object to this and say, well, in Islam, all lives matter, and we, we know that. Any of us who's saying black lives matter, we know all lives matter, especially if we're Muslim. But what we recognize is that there's something special. There's a special attention, whether it's through the prison industrial complex, there's special attention given to these African-American males. Whether we're talking about just being shot down in the streets and nothing happening with the people who are doing the killing, that's special attention. We can go through a long list and we'll see that yes, there is a need to say black lives matter, that we are not gonna denigrate, we're not gonna put down anybody who's saying Black Lives Matter. As a matter of fact, coming out of a session earlier today, a sister gave me a very insightful, uh, made a very insightful comment that I intend to incorporate 
in the few things that I say, and that is that now we should start saying, because of the Muslim response to Stefan Clark, we should start now saying, all black lives matter. Whether it is a Muslim or not, lives matter. When human beings are being targeted like this, it should all matter. So what do we do? What do we do? Do we take a knee, Muslims, like Colin Kaepernick, when we see this just random, random killing of African-American males and Latinos and the other people of color? Do we take a knee? What do we do? What do we do about the structural racism? What do we do about the prison industrial complex? What do we do about corporate control over every aspect of this society? What do we do, Muslims? Do we take a knee? Well, maybe taking a knee is not your thing. But find what your thing is. Because on Kiyama, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to question you and I about what did you do? You were the ones who have been raised for the enlightenment of humanity. You were chosen because you enjoined what is right and forbid what is wrong. What did you do, Muslims? Is a question that we should all keep in our mind and be afraid about every day of our lives. Assalamu alaikum.